I want to start my talk with a little story. It's a story about two nerdy looking engineers who about 40 years ago decided they could design a product better than the place at which they were working. So they moved down the street and they started a company. A couple months later, they hired an immigrant from Hungary to help them run the company. And then they got a little money and a few short years later, they did something called an IPO, an initial public offering. They raised $9 million. Their company was worth $50 million. Tiny by today's standards when you think of Facebook being worth $50 billion. But I'll tell you one thing. Everyone in this room is using one of their products today. Now, why is this story important? Well, we've been here to talk about ecosystems. How does this, how, what does this have to do with the intersection of innovation and inspiration? of technology, entertainment, and design, and the natural world? Well, as former President Bill Clinton might say, depends what you mean by ecosystem. Most people, when they think of ecosystems, think of the beautiful Grand Tetons. They think of perhaps the elk I saw on my, outside my yard this morning, or the, or the bison I saw when I was driving here this morning. But there are other kinds of ecosystems. The ecosystem for company formation. When you start that little company, Will, be able to, will you be able to recruit that immigrant a few doors down? Will you be able to find people to help you build that company? It might be accountants, it might be lawyers, it might even be venture capitalists or, God forbid, investment bankers. Um, will you be able to hire smart people that are just coming out of school that can help you build that company? Why is the health of that ecosystem important? Well, here's one reason. For the last 30 years, the United States has outperformed almost every economy in the world. Compare us to Europe. This shows 15 years, but the same thing's true for three decades. We've grown at twice the rate of the entire European Union, and we've had about half the unemployment rate. And of course, it's important if we look forward, because today, what do we have? Today, we have falling markets down 17% in the last three months. We have a 9.1% unemployment rate. We have growth that barely exceeds 1% year over year, not enough to create jobs. And the answer, both if we look backward and say, what caused us to outperform in the last 30 years? And if we look forward and say, how are we going to get out of this mess? How are we going to grow? The answer, a lot of people think, is the same. Innovation. Look at this list of companies right here. It's not just technology companies like eBay or Facebook or LinkedIn. It's also healthcare companies like Amgen and Genentech. It's also, and it's even consumer companies like Under Armour. I wore an Under Armour shirt yesterday. This morning I had a Starbucks cup of coffee. What do all these companies have in common? They were backed by a system invented in America, the system of funding startup companies, of, of helping innovation. That, that system is funded by venture capitalists. In fact, if you look today, at companies funded by venture capitalists in the last 30 years, they employ 11.9 million Americans. That's over 10% of all the private sector workers in the whole country. And last year, they had sales of $3 trillion. That's 10% that's, that's of all the sales in the whole country. In fact, it's 20% it's, it's of our GDP. And they're growing when the rest of the world is shrinking, and yet venture capital is a tiny little industry. The amount of money invested by venture capitalists is two-tenths of 1% of our GDP each year. So when you think about that, wow, that's the job-creating engine of the US economy. That's kind of the heart of the, of the system, the ecosystem of innovation. So let's talk about that ecosystem. What are its key features? How did we get here? Why is it so good? Well, here's one feature. It was, it's built on Phenomenal university research. Our universities in America are the, are the crown jewel of the world. It's built on something we pioneered, universal, excellent public education. It's been built on access to talent from all over the world, wherever they come from. It's been built on free trade. It's been built on great infrastructure, both technology and physical infrastructure. And it's been built on access to capital for fast-growing companies. Why do we even bring this up? Well, when people think about ecosystems, they say, gosh, the climate is under stress. We, we, we face a tremendous issue with climate change. Well, let me tell you something else, and this is something people don't talk about. The innovation, the innovation ecosystem in the United States is under stress. Every one of these building blocks is under assault as we speak. They are all crumbling. 
Let me talk about some of them directly. Okay, who funds university research? How do great universities come about? This is Stanford University. Well, more than half of all the R&D in the United States is funded by the federal government. They give money, most of it for basic research, to brilliant people who study everything from material science to computer science to biomedical research to physics. And they're individual investigators. They get grants from the NIH, the NSF, the DOE, and yes, the DOD. Well, that's, that seems like a good idea, but how does the federal government spend its money today? The bottom two lines are how much money we're spending on R&D and on education. They're dead flat. We're not spending money on that ecosystem. What we're spending money on is health care. Specifically, how are we spending money on health care? We're spending money on consuming health care today. Here are the two biggest health care programs that the federal government funds. One's Medicare, gives money to senior citizens for their health care, heavily subsidized, no matter how much money you earn. Jack Welsh gets the same subsidized health care as a starving person on the street. Medicaid gives money for health care to poorer people, but by the way, it's grown and grown and grown from 1x to, in some states, people at 3x, the poverty level. But look at that. Medicare is four and a half times as big as it was 20 years ago. Medicaid is six and a half times as big as it was 20 years ago. The U.S. economy is only two and a half times as big as it was 20 years ago. That's not sustainable. That's what we're spending our money on. You saw education was a flat line. Well, why is education important? This shows something that should make us all happy if we believe in freedom and meritocracy. This shows the correlation between educational attainment and earnings and wealth in your lifetime. And we live in the most meritocratic society in history. The unemployment rate among people with graduate degrees is like 2%. The unemployment rate among people who haven't graduated from high school is over 15%. And that matters because the average American, first of all, is going to, has been in their job one in four Americans is in a new job this year. One in two Americans is in a new job every two years. And the problem is not just a federal problem, it's a state problem. The states who fund K-12 through education now spend more money on Medicaid than they spend on excellent schools. What are the results of that? Well, here's a long list. How do American students shape up in math and science as 15-year-olds? Well, they're not only behind China and Singapore and South Korea, as you might expect, they're behind Estonia and Poland and Hungary. In fact, we're below the average in math of the industrialized nations of the world. And, and the underinvestment driven by entitlement spending, it's not just confined to education. It's also combined, it goes to infrastructure, another building block I talked about, both highways and broadband infrastructure. Again, we've gone in 10 years from 4th to 15th among the major industrialized countries in broadband per capita, and yet it's access to broadband that makes people more productive, more capable of supporting innovation and growth. Now, let's talk about another pillar, talent. I've been a venture capitalist, so you can tell because I said the importance of venture capital, for 20 years. We did a study of the role of foreign-born nationals, of newcomers to this country in creating new companies. 25% of the companies that have come public since 1990 were founded by foreign-born nationals. In the high-tech sector, it's 40%. Among new companies funded by venture capital right now, it's almost half. And what do we do with highly talented science engineers and mathematicians who come to the United States? We throw them out of the country because we cap the number of visas for them, H-1B visas, at 65,000. Now, what, what does it mean when you think about talent? Some years ago, in the mid-90s, I visited my sister who lived in Madras, India, and I met a company called Infosys. At the time, they had 1,000 employees and a couple million dollars in revenue. Today, they employ 120,000 people, and they have $6 billion in revenue. And recently, I saw the founder of Infosys. I said, where are you going to put the next 100,000 jobs? And he gave me the quote that's right at the bottom. He said, it's determined by demographics and access to talent. We're going to go where the talent is. Well, the last pillar is capital, access to capital for growth companies. Over 10 years, we did a lot of things that seemed like good ideas. We said, we're going to decimalize the NASDAQ so that it's not so expensive for people to trade stocks. We're going to separate research and investment banking. We're going to regulate new issuers. It all sounds like fine, except that here's what happened. The investment bankers who fund small companies said, well, we're not going to make any money trading, so we're going to get out of that business. We're not going to make any money doing research on small companies, so we're going to get out of that business. And the result is, far less information, 
far less liquidity, and far less company formation and innovation. In fact, we average as a country 100, 500 IPOs a year, 160 tech IPOs a year through the 1990s. For the last 10 years, we've averaged 19, 160 to 19. And the result, of course, is that the, that's not true, by the way, in China or Singapore or the growth economies of the world. So that last year, the market share for IPOs in North America was 16%, one six. In the 80s and 90s, it was 80%. Right now, when a venture capitalist leaves a company, when they have to exit it to make money for their, for their investors, it used to be half the time they took it public, half the time they sold it. Now, it's 95% of the time they sell it to a bigger company. Does anybody here think Cisco Systems would employ 100,000 people today if in 1987 they had sold to DEC? Of course not. Lastly, it's a national security issue. One of the reasons Americans are secure, one of the reasons we have the most advanced military in the world, we fight wars remotely using highly advanced communication systems, providing video feeds back and forth. If we don't have the most secure information technology networks in the world, we won't be the most secure nation in the world. Okay, so what do we do about this? The answer. Well, one thing, we should be happy because innovation can dig us out of it. This company that I mentioned at the beginning, that company was Intel. Okay? Today, the company founded by Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore, who were the two nerds on the first page, employs 82,000 people, has a market cap of over $100 billion, operates in 68 countries, produces 80% of the computer or cell phone chips in the world. And by the way, if you, adjust, if you invested on that little tiny IPO at a split adjusted price of two cents, you would have made 1,100 times your money. But it's not just Intel. In fact, technology and communications and advances in life sciences have made the world a better place. This is, this is the greatest time in human history to be alive. More people all around the world have access, life expectancy have doubled. More people have access to healthcare. More people have access to clean water. More people have access to computers. And yes, people are being dragged out of poverty at an historic rate. The good news about that is we are more capable of solving our problems. The bad news about that, if you're an American, is that great progress is not confined to America. It's all over the world. We have to figure out what we're going to be good at, how we're going to compete, what are we going to, how are we going to lead the next wave of innovation. And there's two things we need to do right away. We need to be stopping so self-indulgent that we invest in consuming, that we invest in the past, that we invest in over-consuming healthcare in particular, and spend more time investing in the future, investing in broadband, investing in university research, investing in education. And secondly, yes, we need to change our laws so that a young company is exempt from Sarbox, that a young company can go public on the NASDAQ. In China, they started the growth enterprise market, the growth, the, a, a market for young companies in Shenzhen just a year ago. 300 companies were lined up to come public the day it opened. And today in China, the average market cap of a young company that comes public in Shenzhen, $100 million, average deal size, $35 million. The world we invented is being copied by everyone else. Most importantly, we need to make growth the organizing principle of our policies. You know, that's nowhere more true than in Wyoming. I mentioned all those jobs created by venture capitalists. Well, most of those 80,000 jobs of Intel are in California. In fact, 2.9 million jobs on venture-backed companies are in California. In Wyoming, there's four venture-backed companies, 286 jobs. A few years ago, I watched, I watched a TED Talk by a guy named Jay Walker of Walker Interactive. And he talked about English being the killer app. He said there were billions of people around the world who wanted to learn English. And you know what I did? I went and found a company that does that, that invests in taking Wyoming teachers and teaching English over the internet to companies in China, Japan, and Korea. That company's Aleutian Technology. I'm the biggest investor in it. But that's an example of what's possible. Because a, a, a generation ago, Wyoming's biggest problem was remoteness. But technology and telecommunications has solved that problem. We can have new types of companies in Wyoming if we both maintain the things that have made us well off, leadership and energy in particular, but also if we invest in our own broadband, if we invest in Hathaway scholarships that give access to college for everybody in Wyoming, if we invest in our K-12 system. In fact, we talk about the ecosystem here in the Tetons. I'm sure everybody here was, would be happy if they saw that herd of elk. I was really happy this summer when I saw broadband being laid over Togedy Pass and over Teton Pass <laughs> right into Jackson Hole. So Wyoming, so 
the summary is we can be a growth economy, we can innovate both in the country and in Wyoming, but it depends on the choices we make if we want a better life. Thank you very much.